Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our tonight's webinar with Robin Whaley. I'm Boris Bergman from Data Color, and uh, the webinar is all about fine art print for amateur photographers with Robin. Today it will be Robin with me. Hello, Robin. How are you doing? Hello, Boris. I'm very well, thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, this webinar um, is presented from Data Color Europe. Robin is located in the UK. I myself are, am located in Germany, and we have attendees from all around the world here. So, just a few information at the beginning. We will recall this webinar. You will receive a follow up mail hopefully tomorrow. In that follow up mail, you will have all one hand the special offers we have prepared for you you will see at the end and you will also see the link for the recording so um we will have about an hour um around about where we do the presentation robin and i and then we go into a question answer section and we'll answer all the questions uh, in a verbal form. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the question section. Um, we will pick them up um, maybe during the webinar, but mainly after the webinar. The question and answer section will be not recorded. Thank you. Okay, Robin, um, you and I, um, it's our first webinar. So I'm Really excited to have you here because uh, we have a crowded room today. And uh, so let's start before we do too much talk. We have a good starting session yesterday and that was very, very nice. Thank you. Okay, um, as the webcam yours and mine is not in the recording and it takes some bandwidth, I will turn off my webcam now. And uh, you please also do this. Um, in yeah, and so we have a larger screen. So um, what we are doing? Have a look. Um, it's Robin and me. You see these photos, Robin. We have been talking about this yesterday. <laughs> yeah, they are not up to date, but <laughs> okay, yeah. that's the situation. So this is the younger Robin and the younger Boris here. So, but that's that's no problem, Robin. Um, Please um, have a few seconds and tell us a little bit about yourself, about your history, uh, how you become book author and photographer. That okay, nice. thanks, but thanks, Boris. Um, I should also admit that I photoshopped that uh, photo that you're looking at as well, um, just to make the uh, wrinkles go away. <laughs> Dynamic skin softener, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I've actually been. Um, a photographer for around 30 years and it wasn't something I took seriously until probably about the year 2001 I think it was when I bought, bought the first SLR camera and so I've been through film and I've been through digital and I sort of I got at the time I'd been working as a project manager for a number of banks and I decided that some of the software, the the books that had been written for it weren't very good. So I decided I'll try and write my own and see if I can do any better. And so I started publishing books probably around 2010. And since then, I've gone full-time professional photographer, deciding it was a, a much better lifestyle than working as a project manager in a bank. And um, so for, for the last six years now, I've been a full-time professional photographer, selling photography, doing YouTube, doing uh, lots of tutorials on my website, and obviously writing books and video courses as well. Okay, perfect. So, but let's have a look what we will do today. We have an agenda where we talk about general color management, a little bit about monitor calibration, color management in DxO PhotoLab, what about color space and so on. And um, at the end, we will have an outlook, um, but very brief for our next webinar that will be take place on April 16th, same time, uh, where it's exporting and printing images with DxO PhotoLab so that we have a little outlook for what will come next. And uh, 
We have arranged, uh, um, Robin and I, and um, that means at this point, Robin will take over and share his screen with us. Therefore, I will promote you to be moderator so that you can share your screen with us, please, because it's your turn now. Okay, thank you very much, Boris, for the introduction. Um, could I actually, rather than just dive into the presentation now, could we just start with a very quick poll to yes, find out course. who's yes. already printing their photography uh, yeah. this evening? So we will do this. Um, so let's have it in here. So for all of you, please just um, let us give us a little feedback and uh, by selecting the option um, if you print your images, because then um, we will have a few more questions to come because this will allow Robin and me later on to tailor our presentation a little bit to your needs. And I will share the results within a few seconds. So more than 80% of you have, much more have voted now. So I will close this vote and share the results. Robin, you see, 64% um, use their own printer, 32 use a photo lab or online printing, and 15% are not printing yet, um, as you have the option uh, to bought more than one. You will see it's about a little bit above 100. So that's okay. So please, Robin, continue. Oh, yep. Thank you very much for that. And thank you, everyone, for just voting on the poll. It does help me to try to tailor the information, as Boris said. So tonight, what I want to do is demonstrate to you that color management is probably the most important part of fine art photo printing. But unfortunately, it's also probably going to be the least well understood, especially amongst amateur photographers. Now, color management, as we'll be discussing it, ensures that you get accurate colors and tones in your print. And just to get rid of a misconception, it still applies even if you're only working in black and white. It doesn't have to be that you, you're working in colour in order to take advantage of colour management. Now, the, the problem with this is that without colour management, um, your tones and colours probably aren't going to match what you see when you're editing your images. And so you're going to be disappointed when you produce a print. And producing accurate prints consistently without color management is, and I speak from bitter experience, impossible. So in this webinar, what I'm going to do is share with you a basic color managed workflow to help you when you're editing and printing. But I'm not just going to give you a workflow that you follow blindly, because that's not really going to help you. Instead, I'll be explaining the foundations of color management because I want to strip away a lot of misinformation and partial truths that I see published in a lot of places. So let's start at the beginning with monitor calibration because that is the key to getting everything else that follows right. So although this is a webinar about printing, calibrating your monitor is a critical first step. And if you don't do this, you're going to be taking some very big risks. So to give you some examples, you're going to make very poor adjustments when editing because the colors on your display are probably wrong. And this also is going to cause you to misjudge the image tones. And you could end up making prints that are either too dark, too light, and could well be the wrong color as well. And you can even lose detail in the image as a result of not having color management properly embedded in your workflow. And worse still, if there is a problem somewhere in your printing workflow, you're unlikely to be able to identify it because your monitor isn't calibrated. And color management brings a consistency and predictability to your editing. But just to get rid of another misconception, a correctly calibrated monitor doesn't guarantee that your image is going to display correctly on another monitor for reasons we'll be discussing very shortly. Now, what I'd like to do is give you an example of one of my early printing disasters. So 
sorry. And this goes back to the year 2004. And I'd actually paid to have several very large, expensive prints made by a pro photo lab. And when I received my prints back, I looked at them and I was absolutely distraught because they were too dark and there was a magenta color cast in the shadows. So I immediately did what every other photographer does, and I suspect a lot of people have done on this webinar, and I blamed the printing company. And it was only when I changed my monitor a few months later that I realized the cause of the issue was the monitor. It hadn't been correctly calibrated. And I could have avoided all the problems and expense and the arguments with the printing company if I'd just calibrated the monitor. But it, it isn't just the prints that were wrong. When I look back at all the images that I'd edited on that monitor and I'd saved them, they were all wrong. So I had to start again with any of those prints that I wanted to keep. So let's talk about calibrating a display and how you can avoid problems like that one that I've experienced. So at this point, Boris, could we actually have another quick poll? Because I'd like to understand the proportion of people on the webinar who are using a desktop or a laptop display for their editing. OK, just start at that one. So the question is, who of you is using a laptop or a desktop monitor? Or maybe both. Place. Thank you. OK, we have a quite crowded room tonight, so it takes a few seconds. OK, that sounds good now. 90% have voted, and here is the feedback. So 25% use both. That's interesting to know. And the majority use a desktop monitor. OK. okay. Please Thank continue. You. <laughs> Thank you. That's actually a lot higher proportions using desktop monitors than I would have expected, but that, that's good. So what I'd like to do now is to talk you through the calibration example. And to calibrate a monitor accurately, you absolutely need to have a hardware solution. You can't do this using only software and your eye. It's just too subjective. So in a moment, I'll take you through how I calibrate my display, and I'm using a data color spider. And because this is a webinar, I can't actually run the calibration software on my monitor. So what I've done is I've taken screenshots instead. And I'll also just warn you that the improvements that the unit made to my screen, I can't actually show you that either, not realistically because of the webinar for reasons that you'll understand later. So let's move on and have a look at the calibration screens. So what I've done is I've taken some screenshots as I walk through the data color software. And the first one gives me a choice of what do I want to do when I open the software? Do I want to calibrate my displays or do I want to soft proof an image? And we'll be talking about soft proofing a little later on and also in the next webinar. So if for this example, I would pick calibrate my display and then I'll click the next button. And that takes me to the next screen where what I see are three different workflows. Now, the one I want to use is the one to dis for a display calibration, but the other two are quite useful as well at times because you can, if you've got multiple monitors, like some of you have got the desktop and the um, laptops, you could do it, use the studio match to match them so that they've all got the same calibration. They all look the same. The other one is to look at a display's performance so you can understand whether or not that display is aging and maybe it needs to be changed or even just recalibrated. So I'll pick the display calibration, click the next button to move to the next screen. And this is where I'm going to set up the display settings that I want to use and also the calibration settings. So the next screen tells the software a little bit about the display that I'm using. So if you've got multiple displays, as I have, you can pick here that you want to, um, which, which of the screens you want to calibrate. And also 
whether or not it's actually just a uh, desktop or you can also do um, all in one laptop and also project a calibration here. The next item is the display technology, and the descriptions here are actually very good for picking the correct display type if you don't, don't know it. And then at the end, we've got what type of controls are on the display. So in the case of my Mac, because it's a studio display, I don't have any of these options, and PC users will probably recognize things like brightness and Kelvin straight away. So once I've filled in those details, I click Next, and I move on to the next screen, which is the calibration setting. So this is how I want to calibrate my monitor. And as you can see, I'm doing a full calibration here. And then I've got some basic settings. So things like the gamma setting, so how bright is it? But we also have the white point, which I've got set to 6,500 Kelvin, and also the brightness in terms of looms. And I've just gone for the recommended settings on all of them, and it, it works very well. The other thing that's very useful here is that I've got a room light analysis. So I've got that turned on, and what it does is the calibration unit will measure the light falling on my screen because that can affect how I perceive the colors and brightness of it. And so it will measure that and set the brightness level accordingly. Once I've filled in my settings, I just click the next button, and this is the point where I start to place my spider onto the display. And there's even a little template here which shows where to place it. After that, we get the colored screens. So it will display a series of red, green, blue, gray screens, and it will measure the colors that are being displayed. And the reason it's measuring it is it's trying to work out, is there any variation in the screen to what should be displayed. And it will use that information to generate what we call a display profile. The next screen, which is when it's finished this, is where we can actually save our profile. So we can name it, save it, and that will also install it into our computer system so that that's then the default display. And we also have a scheduler here so I can set to recalibrate my display regularly because over time and when you, you've got a lot of use of a monitor, you'll find that the settings drift on it and that can cause perhaps a shift in brightness or a shift in the color tint. So I, I set mine up to actually um, recalibrate on a monthly basis. Once I've done that, I'm through to a screen where I can see a chart here, a test chart. And this allows me to see the calibration results, comparing it against my uncalibrated screen. And this is unfortunately what I can't show you. There is though another screen here, which shows the performance of my monitor. So let me just zoom in on that because I want to just show you part of it. If you notice here on this chart, what we've got is a small blue triangle inside a red triangle. The blue triangle is the what we call the sRGB color space, and I'll be talking more about these shortly. The red triangle is actually my monitor's color space. And what it shows me is that my monitor is completely enclosing the sRGB color space. So my monitor can display 100% of sRGB. You can also see how it performs against other color spaces like Adobe RGB. And again, my monitor, when I checked it, gives me 87% of Adobe RGB. Now we'll be coming back to talk about these in a minute because they're really important. So let's just zoom out and we'll go on to the next screen because there's something very important that you need to know about, which are monitor traps. And as technology is advancing, our computer systems are getting smarter and smarter. And unfortunately, they're a little bit too smart sometimes for what we want. So you will probably find features in your computer now like an automatic 
brightness display, and some computers even change the colour of the screen depending on the time of the day. So these changes can actually make editing and making good editing decisions very difficult. So what you need to do is turn them off in the computer operating system. But the problem when you turn them off is that you what you now need to do is control the lighting in the room where you're editing, because what you need is constant, consistent lighting, or you can start to make very bad decisions. Now, to give you some ideas of some simple points that will help you is, one thing that you really must do is position the screen away from any windows or direct light sources, because they will affect the brightness. Something else to consider is using a monitor hood and they're reasonably well priced that fits around the screen and it stops light from falling directly onto the screen because light will reflect off the screen and again it will affect how you perceive colours and brightness. And another thing to consider using, which I use, is a blackout blind that you can just drop down on a window to cut out all the light. And in addition to that, I use a daylight bulb with a known color temperature. And in my case, it's 6,500 Kelvin. And again, these are relatively cheap to buy, even off the likes of Amazon. But what it will do is it will make sure you've got a consistent light in your room where you're editing so that colors and brightness on the screen look consistent all the time. Now, another mon monitor trap that you can come across is what color space does your monitor actually support? And the problem here is that a lot of color, uh, computer manufacturers, and especially the PCs, sell computers with poor quality displays because that's where they can save money. But even if you buy a separate monitor for your display, it doesn't mean you'll avoid this trap. So there's a lot of clever marketing language that can trick you into thinking you've got a better display than you you have so for example i've seen i've seen instances where displays are labeled as 100% compatible with srgb that doesn't though mean that it will display 100% of our srg it only means it can display some of it so watch out for clever language like that that may trick you into thinking your monitor is better than it is. So that's one of the benefits of actually calibrating it because you'll find out the true, you know, the genuine situation of how, how wide a color space it can display. So I've talked a lot about color spaces. Let's talk about what they actually are. Now, I'm sure everyone on the call has heard the term RGB image. So these images have three color channels, red, green, and blue. And it's these color channels that combine together to produce the colors we see in the image. And this is what we call the color model. But RGB, <clears throat> it isn't the only color model that there is. There are others, and for example, CMYK. CMYK, to explain it, has four color channels, which are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black and it's commonly used in the printing industry. Now for tonight's webinar, everything we're covering applies only to the RGB color model. So the color model is how color is created by combining three color channels. But the color space is something different. What the color space does is determine the range of colors that can be produced in the image. So let's have a look at three common color spaces. And I want you to think of the blue color channel only in the RGB image. So the smallest of these color spaces is sRGB. And because it's the smallest, it has the least range of colors that it can produce. And you can see this represented in the graph. The next in size is Adobe RGB, and that's bigger. And again, you can see that it can represent more and varied colors in comparison to sRGB. But it isn't the biggest. That goes to something called Prophoto RGB. And I honestly don't know where they come up with these names. Um, it would be much nicer if they call them something else, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, 
So let's let's apply this now, what we know about these three color spaces and their size to photo editing. And I want to show you a chart. I'm just going to zoom in on one of these. And these charts represent different color spaces and their relative size and range of colors that they can display. Now, although they're odd shapes, I want you to just notice something very simple. We've got red, green, and blue, and they merge or combine together to produce different colors. And this yellow triangle you see here is a color space. Outside of that, though, we've got this dotted um, shape. And what that is, it's the color space required for a photo of a poppy. Now, I haven't got the poppy, and it, it's irrelevant. So just imagine that this is a photo, and you can see it's falling outside of the color space. Now, let's just zoom out again. The, the thing with this color space is it's quite small, and that is because it's sRGB. The other color space we've got here in the second graph is much larger. And as you can see, the poppy image falls well with inside it. And that second color space is Profoto RGB. And it can produce the broadest range of colors. And it, it's tempting to think that that's the best one to use for photo editing and fine art printing. But that isn't necessarily the case for reasons that you'll learn about. Now, one of the problems with Profoto RGB is these areas here that fall outside of the graph. These are colors, but they are what we call imaginary colors or theoretical. They exist mathematically, but we can't see them, display them, or print them. So to, come, to overcome this problem, DxO went away and they created something called the wide gamut color space. And if you look at it, so over here on the right-hand image, you've got the green triangle, and it's similar in size to Profoto RGB. So it's a similar size color space. But notice it doesn't have any areas that fall outside of the chart. So it doesn't have any of these theoretical colors at all. Um, and, and that is a great benefit when it comes to photo editing for reasons that you, you'll see shortly. Now, at this stage, what I would like to do is switch to using the uh, DxO Photo Lab software because I want to show you where to find the color space settings in that. So if you bear with me a moment, I'm just going to pause my display. And I'm going to switch now to Photo Lab. And I will re-enable the display. Hopefully that's all showing up fine now. It works. Fantastic. So what I've got open here is just a, an image, a raw file that has some editing done on it, not very much at this stage. And I've got the controls here for editing the image in uh, Photolab. They're arranged into tabs. So this one's the brightness, this one's the color, this one's the detail, this one's um, correction of the lens uh, distortion. But if we go to the color tab here, right at the top, we've got working color space listed. And we now have in this drop down two versions. We've got the classic legacy version. So this was, I think it was in Photo Lab 5 and previous versions. But from Photo Lab 6, we've got the DxO wide gamut color space. So I'm just going to switch to that. And you immediately see there is a change. Now, some of that change is down to the how the raw file is being interpreted. But if you watch the colors in the clouds, what you see on the classic is that they're much duller and more orange. And I'm hoping you can see this. Whereas in the white gamut color space, we've got much more vibrant colors and they, they seem somehow more lively. Now, that is just as a result of changing the color space we're working in. 
So when you come to edit, if you're using Photolab, I'd recommend switching to the wide gamut color space. In other software, you may find things like, um, you may have a choice of things like Profoto RGB and Adobe RGB. I wouldn't recommend at this stage using a, a Profoto RGB if you're going to be printing. And I'll explain more about that later in the process because it will make your life easier. So I'd probably recommend something like editing in Adobe RGB. So let's just pause that now. And I'm going to go back to the presentation. Robin, maybe it's a good idea to ask the attendees about if they shoot in RAW. What do you think? Um, that would be absolutely great idea. Thank you. OK, here we are. So yes, no, or for those like I do, I have a camera with two uh, space uh, slots for SD cards, and I shoot both. OK. Thank you. I will share the results with you, and you will see uh, a majority of 3% says, no, I don't shoot in RAW, and s almost 70% say, yes, shoot in RAW. Perfect. Thank you. That's very helpful. So in terms of then the color spaces, what I was just describing is something called a gamut problem and sorry if you bear with me a moment there's too many things on my screen um, we've we've got something called a gamut problem so what i would like you to do is think of a desktop home printer or one at a photo lab now these printers can reproduce a limited set of colors and we call this set of colors their gamut and each printer is different but and it's not, a, a Rowan, and it's not only the printer. Think about you using high gloss paper, and tomorrow you use a matte paper, which could be for, think about black and white prints uh, of elder, portrait of elderly people can be great having this on a matte paper. And, uh, but of course, the paper has an impact as well. So that comes still on top. That's right. So, yeah, as you say, every printer, paper, and even the type of ink can actually combine to affect this gamut of what can be produced. And the thing is that although each paper and combination has a unique gamut, most of them are not much bigger than the sRGB color space that we've been talking about as being very small. So, when it comes to printing a photo, we still have to do something with all these colors that lie outside of this color space. And because they lie outside of the color space of what can be produced, they're called out of gamut. And the problem with out of gamut colors is we still need to print them. If we don't, we end up with gaps in our print. Now, what I'd like you to do is just think about when you're editing a photo in one of these large color spaces. And it, if it's much larger than SRGB, you can imagine that there's a much higher chance that you're going to find colors that fall outside of the gamut that can be reproduced. And we'll look in a moment about how to fix that. But th there is another important point here, which is if you've got a computer monitor that can only support the sRGB color space, and you're editing in a color space that's much larger, then th that will also have out of gamut colors, potentially a lot, that can't be displayed, but still need to be displayed somehow. So let's just have a look now at how that display happens. So if we can't display a color because it's out of gamut, we still need to display something. And the solution is to replace the out of gamut colors with ones that can be displayed. And 
The thing is, we need our computers to handle this for us automatically whenever they encounter an outer gamut colour. And our computers do this by using something called a rendering intent. Now, I know it sounds odd, but please try to remember that term rendering intent because it's very important. The rendering intent tells the computer and the software how out of gamut colours should be replaced. And there's several of these rendering intents that you'll come across. But the two main ones that you'll probably come across in photography are called relative and perceptual. Now, with the relative rendering intent, only the out of gamut colours are changed. The rest of them are left. And those out of gamut colours are shifted so that they go to the nearest in gamut colour that can be displayed. Now, the other rendering intent, perceptual, also changes the out of gamut colours to something that can be displayed. But, and this is important, the difference is it will change all the other colours in the image as well, so they're all shifted in proportion. So we get a shift of potentially all the colours in the image. Now, although the rendering intents allow us to display or print our gamut colours, they're doing it by changing the image colours and tones. And that can create a noticeable shift when you produce a print. Now, this isn't actually, though, the end of our problem, because you may find that your printer requires images in the sRGB colour space. So if you're trying to print an image in something like a Profoto RGB colour space, the printer is going to try and do a conversion. But here's the thing. Not all software can handle Profoto to sRGB conversions very easily. And then you can see some very wild color shifts indeed. And I'll probably show some of these in a later webinar. But the other thing about the rendering intent is it also has to be a solution that's used with our color monitors as well. So let's have a look at that next. What I've got here is a raw file. So on the left, we see the raw file showing some red maple leaves, and this is an unedited raw file. These are actually well outside of the sRGB color space, even before I, I started editing. Now, look at the image on the right of this here. What we're seeing here is gamut warning that's been turned on for the sRGB color space. So this is telling me that these colors fall outside of the sRGB color space, which is why the leaves are covered by the warning. The colors there are well outside of what we can display in sRGB. Now compare this with the center image. That's showing a warning, but for my monitor. And you can see that the majority of the leaves can now be shown accurately on my screen. But the blue pixels are what, what are falling outside even what my monitor can display. And the thing is with this webinar, it's going to be very difficult to show you this because as we're doing the webinar, it's probably being converted into the sRGB color space just to make sure that everything you see at your end is as, as accurate as possible and you're not having strange shifts in color. So Robin. before we move on, though, what I'd like to do is take a moment to show you an example in Photolab so that you know where to find the warning indicators. So I'm just going to stop the presentation and I'm going to switch back to Photolab. And this time, what I would like to do is go to the Maple photo. And here I'm going to show you some of the warnings that you can see. So if you look at my histogram up here, that actually has several warning indicators. At the bottom, we've got a moon and a sun. And these are to show clipping indicators, but they are for shadows. And at the moment, there's nothing clipping in the shadows. And highlights, where we've actually got some clipping. But as well as that, we've got color space clipping. So this is where things are falling outside of the color space my monitor can display. Now, I suspect that a lot of you are seeing here 
orange, orangish leaves, whereas I'm seeing a deep, vibrant red. And I'm just going to turn on the warning now for my monitor, which is this monitor symbol here, and you can see the blue highlights. So let me turn that off because I'm going to come down now to on the color tab and I'm going to come down to the bottom and I've got here a soft proofing option. And I've got that set up at the moment to show me the sRGB color space. So if I now turn on my monitor, sorry, my color space warning, which has now become enabled, you can see that it's highlighting everything is falling outside of that color space so here's Robin, the thing sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt but two information one thing the warning for the monitor is absolutely unique for dxo other applications do not have this that's something important to know but all um, warning, gamut warnings what we can see here do not tell you how much out of the gamut size uh, the color is. So it could be just out of the gamut or it could be far out of the gamut. You can't see this from the warning. It's just warning on or off. That's something you should know about also. Yeah, thanks, Boris. Those are actually really important points that I I, I sort of missed <laughs> um, in, my, in my rush to get the information out. Um, I do want to show you something else, though, which is very strange. So I'm going to turn off the soft proofing. I don't know how well this will come across. I'm going to magnify my image to 100%. I'm just going to focus in on some of these leaves. And here we can see a leaf with a vein running through it. And hopefully you can see that as well. If I turn on the soft proof to force everything into the sRGB color space, all of a sudden the veins vanish. So what's happening here is that the, as the colors are being squashed into the smaller color space, we start to lose detail in the image. And that can actually be critical in print, producing a fine art print. So it's something again to just watch out for. So I'm just gonna minimize that now and switch back to the presentation. Here we go. And I want to now talk about something called bit depth. Because again, this is something where there's a lot of misinformation goes around. And I'm sure a lot of you on this call will have heard of something called bit depth and the idea of an 8-bit image or a 16-bit image. But what does the bit depth actually do? We've already found out we've got a color model with red, green, and blue color channels. And we've got a color space that dictates the range of colors. Well, the bit depth actually determines the number of different colors that could possibly be represented in an image. So let me explain this using a simple one bit RGB image example. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know that computers use binary and are based on the binary number system. Now, in binary, a number can be represented by zero or one. So if we've got a one bit binary number, it has a single digit, and that digit can be either zero or one. So we have two possible values. But as this is an RGB image, it has three color channels, and it means that each of these color channels can produce two possible colors, but they combine to produce the color we see. So in a one-bit image, each color value has can produce two colors, and that means we've got two times two times two, or eight possible colors that we can represent in an eight, in a one-bit image. So hopefully, everyone's followed that. So I just want to increase the number of bits now to eight bit, because this is where things get interesting. In an eight bit number, we can represent two to the power of eight because there's eight possible digits in the number. So there are 256 possible values. But as there are three color channels, each of those can produce 256 colors. 
When you combine them, 256 times 256 times 256, you've got a possible 16.7 million colors that an 8-bit image can display. But we don't want to stop there. Let's go to a 16-bit image. When we've got 16 bits, we've got 16 digits now. And that means we can produce 600 and, sorry, 65,536 possible numbers with a 16-bit image. And in that image, we've got three color channels. So if you multiply that number by itself three times, you end up with 2.814 times 10 to the power of 14, or about 281 trillion possible colors in a 16-bit image. So let's now talk about what that means for us by summarizing it and why it's important for printing. Well, what we've covered is that the color space determines the possible colors in the image, while the bit depth controls the number of colors that can be reproduced. And the higher the bit depth, the more possible colors in the image. And that's important when editing. Because if we can't reproduce sufficient colors in our image, the areas of continuous color, like a blue sky, aren't going to show a smooth transition between the different colors. And that can also show up when we're printing. Now, what happens when we see, well, what happens when we see problems like this occurring is something called color banding. And that's where the changes made to colors when we edit them start to group together into bands of color that become visible because we haven't got enough um, possible colors in the image. And you've probably heard the advice, it's much better to edit an eight, a 16-bit image because there's less chance of banding. And that's because the 16-bit image can reproduce so many more colors, 281 trillion as opposed to 16.7 million. And that's what creates this smooth transition between the pixels. But the bit depth isn't the entire story because it doesn't consider the effect of the color space. So imagine trying to fit a limited set of colors into a small color space. Well, there's probably going to be because there's fewer possible colors, they're not going to be as spread out. So the transition is not going to be as obvious. But if we have a big color space like Profoto RGB, fewer colors means banding becomes obvious because the, we can't transition smoothly enough between each of the colors. So those of you who earlier said that you're shooting in the JPEG format, you're going to be stuck when editing to an 8-bit image, and um, that could mean that you cause color banding to occur if you produce a lot of editing. So I've, I've tried to produce here a color banding example. I don't know how well it's going to come across because of the video compression. But let, let's try this. So example one here is the original RAW file without any editing applied to it. I've then applied a single curves adjustment just to increase the contrast, nothing more. So in example two, what we've got is the adjustment was done in the Pro Photo RGB color space, and I'm starting to see banding occur. And as I say, I don't know how well it will come across on the video, but there, there is banding that's become more obvious. Now, in example three, what we've got is the same 8-bit image, but in the sRGB color space, and the banding isn't as obvious. Now, what I would say is, if we'd made the same changes to a 16-bit image, there'd be no evidence of banding at all. So my advice to you is to start with a RAW file and to use software like DxO Photo Lab for your editing, and that way you can take advantage of the wide color space that we discussed earlier. But you also need to be working in 16-bit. So if you're starting with a RAW file, that's guaranteed. If you're starting with a JPEG, you've only got an 8-bit image, so you could run into these problem, color problems of banding. But to convert the RAW file into colors and tones, what we need is something called a camera profile. So if I just move on now, um, the, color, the camera profile 
is what instructs the raw converter how to convert the data in the raw file and render it as colors and tones because raw data isn't in color and tone it's just information now while you can select a profile in your camera that will only be applied to the jpeg image because the jpeg image to be rendered needs that color profile the raw files though are what we call profile independent and that is what allows us to select a color profile or a camera profile later when we're actually editing the raw file and that's important because to the the, the color well it's important because the color profile or the camera profile doesn't actually produce accurate colors. What it does is it produces a look. So one, for example, may have low saturation and neutral colors, whereas another profile could produce highly saturated blues and greens. And because they don't produce an accurate color, what you're seeing is a rendering of the image with a look. And again, JPEG users, you're having that look embedded into your image automatically for you. But if you're shooting with a raw file, what you've got is the ability to create a camera profile that will produce accurate colors if you use a color calibration chart and software. So for my photography, I'm using the um, chart you see here, which is the Data Color Spider Checker Photo and I'm using it with the Excel Photo Lab. So what I'd like to do now is show you a quick demonstration of how I can use this software to generate me a unique color profile for my camera. So I'm just going to stop the show slideshow again, and let's just open up the Photo Lab, and that was the example we were in before. And I'm just going to switch now to a color checker for cat, I can't say it, color checker um, photo that I've taken. Let's right, there we go. So hopefully everyone can see that now. And at the moment, I'm in the, here in the um, color tab, and I've got the classic color space open. Just watch what happens, by the way, to these blues here as I change to the white gamut space. You can see that we've got a change of color instantly because the white gamut space can handle these colors where the previous legacy color space didn't handle them as well. Now, the way I'm going to use this chart is to generate a unique color profile for my camera and it will reproduce accurate colors then. So rather than rely on the camera rendering to translate my raw files, I'll be able to use this. And if we look down here, we've got in Photo Lab, we've got the Calibrate Color Profile. And there's a little icon that I can click here. When I've clicked that, what it opens is a space where I can pick the color chart I'm using, like it's a color checker photo. There's even an option to do something called rotate and set the white balance, but I'll just show you what you do. So I click on one corner and I can drag out my chart design and that's when you can actually rotate the image if you need to. And then you can grab the corners of this and just move them onto the corners of the chart like that. And once you've got it accurately lined up, you can just click. And now I can name the chart, the uh, sorry, the profile, and I'll just call this one demo and save it. And now we see the profile applied to my chart so that the colors are accurate. So I'm just going to close that checker and I'll just show you the difference between the display and calibrate, sorry, the, the profile, the uncalibrated uh, chart and the one with the calibration. And you can see how much difference that's making, even to not just the chart itself, but to the carpet that's behind it. And that's how we can actually generate accurate color um, profiles for our cameras using DxO Photo Lab and the Data Color Spider Checker. 
So just let's minimize that again and switch back to the... Shall I just take yep. over for a second? If, and if show... you could, I'm having a little bit of a problem. <laughs> no problem at all. One second. This was the last slide, and I'd like to show you a little bit about the spider checker family from Data Color. You see the spider checker photo here, the newest one. One information the spider checker photo is available in the US in a different case. The case has a, a different shape. That's all. The cards are identical. The cards are interchangeable. Uh, for those who have a spider checker video, um, we will have um, next month the uh, replacement cards. So that means you can create your own set to do video and uh, the regular spider checker photo. Then we have the good old spider checker that's um, more than 12 years in the market now and if you take just the right side it's the spider checker 24 you see and what is new that what we have just seen that you can do your profiles in dxo photo lab 7 directly there's a native support so what you have is you have the cover if it's shaped or non-shaped doesn't matter you see um, the content is identical, where you have an extreme dark black matte paper, you have 24 um, basic colors, you have eight skin tones, and so on. That helps a lot. And I just might want to make it short. There's the spider checker, uh, the 20, uh, 48 um, patches one that comes with uh, a magnetic, magnetic frame so that you can turn around the cards because on the other side, there are grayscale cards that for um, uh, in-camera white balance, for example. So that's the small spider checker 24. That was all from my side and I hand you over now to Robin so you can continue with your part of the presentation. Robin, you're ready? So, I am, thank you. Can oh, you see my screen there? Yes, perfect. Fantastic. It's worked this time. Um, right. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about paper selection and profiling, because this is very important for making an accurate fine art print. And well, I can, here we go. So like with the computer display that we've been talking about, Printing papers have different color gamuts that they can reproduce. And this affects not only the colors, but the tones in the print as well. And typically gloss and semi-gloss surfaces, for example, are going to show much darker blacks and stronger colors when compared with a matte paper. And if you were to hold a gloss print next to a matte print for the same photo, the matte print is probably going to look washed out in comparison. But gloss prints are not necessarily good for some subjects, whereas matte prints are. And if we compare the gamut of the gloss and matte papers, one is probably going to be smaller than the other, and it'll probably be the matte paper will be the smaller. But typically, both of these are going to be smaller than a wide color space, like wide gamut, that we might use for editing. So this means we need to use our rendering intent solution when we come to print the photo to make sure that we bring the um, out of gamut colors into something that can be printed. So when it comes to making a print, how we do that is we could hand over the management of the color to the printer or we can have our software manage it. And that's often the better option. But I'll go into more of that on the next uh, webinar. But to make a print that's accurate and has accurate colors, we first need to profile our paper because the profile controls how the colors are translated into the print colors. And to pr produce an accurate print, I would actually recommend, for reasons you'll see in the next slide, using a custom profile. So I create my custom profiles with a data color spider print unit. And again, I'll show that in the next webinar. And it works by analyzing color charts that are printed out. And then it generate, it measures the colors in that chart and generates 
a profile that instructs the printer how to match what the colors should be. Now, the thing is, before you can even generate a paper profile, you need to choose a paper. And this is where most photographers I speak to come to a decision on which paper to use based on the look of the paper surface and the feel of the paper. And they don't go any further. What you really need to consider, though, is what is the range of colours and tones that that paper can reproduce? Because if you've got a paper that's got a very small gamut, but you've got a photo with a large gamut colour space and a lot of out of gamut colours, then it's going to create a big shift in colour as your out of gamut colours are moved into what can be printed. So to avoid it, you should really go for a paper that's got a wider colour space. So what I want to do now, though, is show you an example. And I think I'd like to have a, a poll if we can here, Boris. Um, of course. I, yeah, but uh, uh, let, let me just close it. We will do it again. Uh, sorry. Um, show your um, yeah. prints first, please. Okay. Oh, that's OK. Um, sorry, I, I'm confusing things. Um, wh what I've done here is I've actually taken a photo and I've reproduced it three times on different exhibition quality matte papers. And all of these matte papers have been made by the same manufacturer and they're very well respected. So to make these prints, though, I used a printer profile supplied by the paper manufacturer. So these are generic profiles that you would download from their website. So what I want to ask is, which of the prints has got accurate colors? So Boris, if we could. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, uh, I cannot relaunch it, but we do it in a different way. Um, for those who say the number one is the best, please, there is a function to raise your hand. Please raise your hand now, and we can see this in the attendee list. Please, just raise your hand. Okay, I see. You see them in the attendee yeah. list. That's quite, yeah, I would say around 15%. Okay, drop your hands, please. I will do it now. And for those who say print number two is the best uh, and has the correct colors, um, please raise your hand now again, please. Okay, that looks a little bit more. Yeah, I would say yeah, yep. something about 20%. Okay, I'll drop your hands. And now please raise your hand for the number three, if you say that's the correct one. And we will have a th another question for you to come because that's, um, I would say, 25%, mm, uh, something about yep. that. Okay. And now the last question, which we have not told you before, is who of you think that none of the print has the correct color? Please raise your hand now. Oh, good. That's, <laughs> that's now a little bit more. So I would say something about 30%. I have to yep. guess it now. But um, Robin, it's on you. Um, to come with the right information, please. Right, thank you, thank you. Right, so for everyone who said that none of the prints are accurate, you're correct. The nearest print is print three, but the sky's still too dark, the foreground's too, too saturated, and it still doesn't look like the original image. And the point I wanted to highlight with this exercise is that these are the generic paper profiles that I downloaded from the manufacturer's website, and they should be right. Yet, these three out of a test pack of about, I think it was 10 papers, these three were all incorrect and produced variations of color. So if a paper manufacturer can get it wrong, you know, anyone can get it wrong. But the, think about this. You've possibly bought a, a box of paper and you've gone to the manufacturer's website, you download the profile and start printing, and it doesn't look accurate. 
So you would immediately blame something else in your workflow as being the problem. You wouldn't necessarily blame the printer profile supplied by the manufacturer. Yet in 30% of the case, in the profiles that I downloaded were wrong. So it is very easy to get profiles that are incorrect. And this is why I recommend actually generating your own profiles if you're taking printing seriously. If you just want to produce prints to put on your wall at home and you're not bothered too much about the color, then the generic profiles may be fine. But if you want to do something a bit more serious, possibly enter competitions, then you really should be looking at a custom profile to make sure you get an accurate print color. So at this point, what I'd like to do now is just talk very quickly about soft proofing and give you an intro introduction to that. And it's set the scene for the next webinar. So soft proofing is what lets us visualize an image as if it's been printed on a certain paper. And it does this by using the printer profile that we've just been talking about. And this is what allows us to understand how different photos will look when printed, but without needing to make the print. And once we've done that, we can actually choose a suitable paper using the soft proofing method in order to then make a test print. But soft proofing can also help us understand something else, which is how the different rendering intents that we've talked about, you know, perceptual or relative, how those will affect the colors in the print when it comes to be made. And it allows us to do something else still further, which is we can simulate the effect of the paper surface to see how it's changing the appearance of tones. So when we said for earlier, for example, earlier that a matte paper may not produce quite as deep a black as a gloss paper. Well, you will see that in the soft proof. And by understanding all these variables, we can then make sensible choices about the paper and print settings that we will use when we come to make a print. But soft proofing also allows us to do something else, which is adjust the image to achieve the best possible colors and tones when we make the final print. And that's something that I'll be covering in the next webinar. And that's when I'll show you how to evaluate a print using the soft proofing features in Photolab and how to produce accurate colors using a home printer or an online print service. So that is my last slide. So Boris, I think you've got a couple of other things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just taking over here. You will see now my um, monitor again. So as Robin mentioned, this will be covered on Tuesday, April 16th. Um, and I said, it's the same time, yes and no. The reason is it's the same time for Europe, but as Europe changed to daylight saving time this weekend, and the US have changed, uh, I think two weeks ago, for those who are located in America, um, there is an hour uh, shift. Sorry. Okay. So um, I had already a question answered that where people said, oh, there's so many information. And yes, color management is something, sorry, to be honest. It's not like a fire and forget product. It's not like in click and install and run. It's like a little bit like photography. You have to know a little bit about the background. And as this background is something you don't do color management every day. You do it today. You will do it in a few weeks, in a few months. So you have a lot of time to forget about all this stuff because you're not using it. It's not your primary aim to understand color management. But unfortunately, you have to do a little bit. So that's the reason why we created a so-called spider ebook, six chapters of color management from a photographer's and videographer's perspective. It's also explaining our products uh, in combination. And the good thing, it's free of charge. You just go to the link mentioned at the bottom of that page, and then you can read this, download this, and you can read this like a book. And as it is a PDF, you can search it. So you have an external reference. For example, if it's Friday night and you have a question and nobody at tech support is available any longer. So you have your external 
reference and information, background information. Please take advantage. Okay, this, uh, as I mentioned, tech support, you can reach tech support via our website. Uh, we have a free phone support in Europe. It's 0800 700 800 70. In the US, it's 800 554 8688. And you can go to our website, go to the support section and just say product support. Whenever you submit a ticket, um, you will also automatically get the information um, from the FAQ, what is maybe answering your question already. And this brings us to our last slide because we have taken some overtime. I hope this was okay for you and I will Say thank you and stop the recording. And we go into the question and answer section now. 